First and foremost, I wanted to make sure that everyone at home knew who I was. So my name is Tom Hollingsworth. I am CCIE number 29213, and I used to be a CISSP. Um, <laughs> I let that one go because it turned out that I wasn't doing as much in that area as I should have. But um, there are a lot of great people out there involved in the CISSP community. Uh, my friend JJ Manila is part of ISC Squared, and I know that she's really doing a great job. But um, the other thing that I do now is that I'm the event lead for Security Field Day here. And so I get to talk to a lot of security folks around the community, and I get to learn a lot about what they're doing. And 12 of them just happen to be joining us today. And I'd like to take a quick moment for each of them to introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Ben Mason. Uh, I'm Ben Mason. I've been in the security industry for absolutely way too long. That plus on, uh, on the other side of 20 is getting too long. I've been uh, deploying, thinking about architectures, taking apart security things for a very long time. Uh, super interested in discussing the, the topics today and uh, being part of uh, Tech Field Day. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Bruno Wallman. i am uh, been a network architect for a really long time and more recently a network security architect and glad to be here. You can find me on Twitter at, at Wallman Bruno. Hello, my name is Edward Kaletke and I'm a virtualization cloud container security architect. And I look at and all different, all things platform is really what I look at. If it's a cluster, if it's a platform, I'm looking at how to secure that. Hi, I'm Justin Warren. Uh, I'm the founder and chief analyst at consulting firm Pivot9. And I, my research interests are uh, data center, uh, enterprise data center and information security. Hi, I'm Karen Lopez. I'm data chick on Twitter. I'll be tweeting a lot during these things. I'm a data evangelist and architect who specializes in data security and InfoSec and really looking forward to today. Hello, my name is Kristen. Um, I live in Germany. I run my own medicine and I'm focused on network and security. So I started my career uh, with telecommunications, was in high security uh, branch later. And um, since 10 years, I'm a freelancer working also in tech marketing for tech companies, B2B only. And yeah, brand new started a career as an analyst for Giga a couple of weeks ago. So thanks. Hi, Mikael Korsgaard. Uh, I'm a technology architect running the infrastructure, mainly server stores and virtualization. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rati, based in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, working for the system integrator as a senior network architect. Uh, currently focusing on enterprise and data center network technologies, but uh, security is taking a big part in my role as well. And uh, yeah, you can find uh, find me on the Twitter with the Pakistan username. Hey, I'm Remington Loose. I work for uh, VAR predominantly in the southeastern United States, and uh, I help customers design and build network infrastructure and security deployments um, in that kind of same general area. And I'm on Twitter at, at localpref.net underscore net. Sorry. I'm Scott Driver, a 20 year IT vet, mostly in infrastructure and virtualization. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at VT is in Vermont, Snowboarder42. Happy to be part of my first security field day. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Ifantis. Uh, I'm a CCIE and also a network forensic analyst. And um, uh, I specialize in uh, deploying network architectures and security architectures. Great. And as mentioned, we do have a special guest joining us from Efficient IP. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex Chauvin. I'm based in, uh, in Paris, um, working for too long as uh, most of, uh, of you are in this industry um, uh, and taking care for efficient IP of the product between marketing and product management. But I want to go ahead and get everything kicked off with just a little bit of an overview, because as we've learned over the last uh, I don't know, months, years. Um, DNS is very important. Um, I use, you know, it's the backbone of the way the internet works. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember what a phone book looks like, um, it is the phone book of the internet. And I know this because when my parents or my non-technical relatives call me every day, when they're like, hey, I can't get to this website. And I'm like, well, can you type this address in? Well, that's not where I'm supposed to go. Okay. Yeah, I'll look at it. Thanks. Because, um, well, the fact that it's always DNS is a meme now should tell you exactly how important this is. But is it always to blame? I think back to the recent Facebook outage, 
where immediately everyone was like, oh, it, it must be DNS. And it wasn't DNS, but it kind of was DNS, but not for the reasons that you think. But it's that DNS is so critical to the way that everything operates that we absolutely have to consider it not only as a critical piece of infrastructure, but also how do we secure it? Because there are a number of ways that you can use DNS as a vector for an attack that won't actually be the fault of DNS. It's just a delivery mechanism. And there should be a lot of things that we're capable of doing in order to improve that, not just from the technology standpoint, but also from the teams and personnel standpoint. And those are the two things that we're going to be talking about today. But right now, I want to move on to our next section, which is about buzzwords, um, specifically NetSecOps. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't understand what NetSecOps is at home, because all of my delegates know what this is, it is Network Security Operations Teams. So it is taking the best and the brightest from the people that make the packets go and the people that make the packets stop and getting them to work together on things. Um, but let me let me talk about something with this because this is an idea that I came up with a few years ago and I wanted to toss it out to the delegates as a way to start this conversation. Um, any particle physicists in the room as a hobby um, probably have heard of something called the grand unified theory, which is there are four basic fundamental forces in nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force that holds an atom together and the weak nuclear force. Well, as we've done more and more research because we're good at physics now, we realize that the electromagnetic force and the weak force are actually the same force. We're just looking at it from different angles, which led us to this idea that what if all four fundamental forces really are the same force, just applied differently? The problem is, is that we need to get to a point where we've researched it thoroughly enough to understand that, and we're still not quite to that level of physics yet. I would posit that in operations, networking and wireless are the same function. They make packets go. One of them just launches them through the air as opposed to launching them th th through copper. But I would also argue that security is just a different aspect of the same thing, packet movement. Except in the securities case, we're trying to keep the packets from moving to certain places. Whereas in networking, we want the packets to go as many places as possible as fast as they can get there. As teams have started to look at the way that packets need to move, specifically related to the cloud, they've realized that both of those functions serve the same purpose. So let's talk about that. What do you think is driving this idea behind NetSecOps? Um, marketers love buzzwords. <laughs> There's the pessimist that I was looking for in the last conversation. So let's just not put a buzzword around it. Let's say that we're just gonna call this team, I don't know, Bill. So the new bill team, not billing, but bill team, is not a buzzword, but it is networking and security teams working together. What could be a driver to merge those two units? All the things oh, if, that caused us to first develop DevOps. Um, you know, like eventually we're going to add all those words together, NetSec, da data, storage ops, and get this really long thing. And it'll have actually just say, IT should work closely with the people doing all the inputs that go into operations. And I think all of these new NetSec ops like things are acknowledging the fact that teams can't work in silos and they need to work together from the beginning, not at the delivery phase, which as a methodologist myself, I think that's wonderful. Um, but I do think that um, it also is sort of still excluding other groups because, you know, where's the data part in here? Where's the data quality part in here? I don't know. I'm making this up because I'm a data person. But I, I love when these new things come about, whether or not the term was put on by a vendor or a marketing person or anything, because it reflects greater collaboration to get better security. But just to, to spin on that point for a minute, Karen, because you do bring up a good point when you say, well, I'm just a data person. Mm -hmm. But every conversation we have, whether it's networking, wireless, data, ser mm -hmm. storage, servers, cloud, we always say, but security is implied. There has to be security in the process. So we don't necessarily think that security is a separate function from all of these other things. But there are a lot of places that treat security 
very differently. Whether yeah. it's the you know the the security silo in your organization that's focused on password changes and PAM authentication, or if it's the physical security of your building that is badge readers and um, certified folks that carry firearms to keep people from getting into the building, or you know <laughs> guard dogs. Um, we treat security differently, even though we say it has to be integrated into everything that we do. So are we, is it a cart before the horse problem? I think it's the fact that um, security means different things. Like you have your security group, your chief security officer, and then you have the thinking of security in whatever it is you're doing, networking or databases or anything. So security by design to steal probably 30 people's tagline. Um, you know, it's like privacy by design. You can't layer these things on after you've done your work and are ready to pass it along to the next person. Now, on top of that, Tom, security is never implied. People who think it's implied are missing the point. It has to be explained in constant detail to everybody. Otherwise, they do not know what threats and actors are trying to address. So a big part of moving these together is actually probably working on threat modeling together. This is where you bring the data together, this is where you bring the designs together, and you end up with a threat model that looks at your attack vectors, your threat actors, and some of them are way out there. I mean, you can have threat models that you're gonna be doing analysis long before you're doing modeling. And the modeling comes from the tools the analysis comes from the experts, either the networking folks or the security folks looking at and saying, hey, that doesn't look right. Or, you know, what about this actor? I'm coming in from this path. It's an unknown path. It's not documented here, but it's an attack vector I could use against that. Yeah. So Tom just mentioned that, that security isn't implied. So in, in that case, it has to be explicit, right? So in the case that Karen was laying out where, you know, maybe Bill's team and Ted's team don't play well together. Isn't that just a leadership issue? Doesn't that bubble beyond the technology to, if we need to have a team that's in the middle mediating between the two teams, I, I would be going up the hierarchy and, and figuring out how to get a unified message and get folks to play nice together. Yeah, I, 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 from that from that same point, I, I, I personally think of the security function in a business as an overlay function across the traditional technology silos. So it's not like there, there this is ideal state, obviously, but I would think the security function needs to be an overlay touching all of the technology silos to make that underlying security as an infrastructure for everybody else, um, you know, to the topic here NetSecOps, i think is actually just bringing back together two function two technology functions that got separated your firewalls and your networking gear that, it, to me that's what i think most people interpret NetSecOps as is bringing back together those two technology functions not what security truly in its dna needs to be of a more what you were describing uh ed as the like threat modeling, the security landscape, the security, uh, information security, design and uh, policy infrastructure that needs to be connected across all technology, including well, databases. When you, start talk, when, you, when you look at it that way, the threat modeling is just one tool that could be used to join the teams back together because there are people in the networking world, the programming world, the developer world that literally just don't care about security, have no knowledge about it. Maybe they're just starting or they've forgotten an actor or a threat vector where the security people are constantly looking at that. I mean, what from as a security person, a security architect, my goal is to say, hey, I'm here to protect my entity, whatever it is. And I need to look at all those actors and threat vectors. And half of my job is educating people why they are problems. Other people may just not see it. And that's, I mean, there are people like that, and that, that, that's the entire organization. And yes, yeah, sometimes you do need people that can translate one language to another language so that they can have that, a valid conversation. And that, so, it, that could be one person, it could be a group of people, it could be just this constant using a, a common tool to have a common language. 
So let me ask somehow you have point. to have that conversation. Let me ask one point on that, Edward, but before we before we jump on. When you say that your job is to teach people about, well, as you said, that they're the problem, but more specifically about security and how they need to be aware of it and things like that. Do you still teach people how to use Microsoft Word? Or do you assume that they have had enough exposure to it that they should know how to at least have the basics down pat? And so the reason, the reason why I ask this question is we all know people in our lives that are not technical. We have reached the point in our daily technology lives where my wife and my mom will send me screenshots of emails and text messages that they get going, this is a scam, right? Instead of just blindly clicking on things that pop up. So we've elevated the noise floor, if you will, for security. Yes, there are advanced threats that are gonna slip through. Hell, I've been caught by them sometimes. But I think that this emphasis on constantly teaching people where the issues are could potentially be an issue in and of itself because we're not focused on stopping things. We're more focused on saying, this is your fault. You need to figure out how to keep yourself from doing it. No, that's not what's implied. It's not somebody's fault. And it's not about saying it's their problem. It's not, it's, a, it's an organization problem. All security is organization wide. You have to look at it that way. It's an organization, let's look at it. You're going to be looking at data security, and there are new things there. How many people think about data po poisoning a data lake and how you would do that? There's where education will be needed. It's a constant education of the new attack vectors. It's not reviewing the old ones and constantly banging on them. It's adding the new ones. So when we do, when I do threat modeling with a lot of people, I don't deal with the threat model itself, I let them do it. I'm adding in more analysis to it, more explanation of these newer thoughts, these newer ways to attack the, attack the subsystems. It could be the latest attack that just came out from, you know, the latest attack against whatever, pick one, right? And people need more information about that, how it happened, why it happened, how they could prevent it. Those things are part of the education process and it's an ongoing process against, yes, you're right. Eventually you're gonna convince people don't do this and they won't or they'll check first, but it's a constant battle because the bad guys are ahead of the, ahead of the defenders in a lot of ways. They're thinking so far outside the box that they're coming up with new ways to attack things. I agree hey, Tom, with can you. I Oh, sorry. I agree with you, but I'm going to put in a, a, a disclaimer here. I just want to point out that most data breaches are still caused by SQL injection and putting uh, sensitive data in open buckets and leaving it there. Like SQL injection has been a problem with data breaches for decades and decades and decades. We know about it. It's easy to detect. It's easy to measure. We have tools to do all that. And yet we still have systems being deployed on the internet that are vulnerable to SQL injection. So sometimes I do think we just need to keep telling people about the old things and then briefing them on the new things that they never even thought was possible. So I'm never going to get up, give up on searching for those two original things. And I want to make sure that, was it Tony that wanted to jump in? Uh, Scott, Tom, um, oh, Scott. I was going to flip your your question around. You said, do we need to teach people how to use Word? No, but um, we do have norms that we need to set with education. And, you know, when when you walk into an organization, there's a norm that says how you do your signature in Outlook. We all know how to do a signature, but you have to do it in a specific way for that specific organization. And I think that's that's the part of education that, that we didn't hit there. It's, it's establishment of norms. It's not necessarily a punitive, you did something wrong. I, I do want to. I, 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 I did want to jump in, Tom, and kind of go back to the, the three questions that are on the screen, or the, rather the, the three questions, it was four bullets. Um, what is, has driven the merger of the teams when we talk about NetSecOps? I, I, I really, I, I've been in an organization where there were two different silos. I've also been in an organization where, where they are one position, they are one team. I think it's a natural symbiotic relationship between the two. 
the amount of walking down the hall to go from the network operations room to the security room uh, was an all day thing. They'd be coming to us, we'd be going to them, they'd be coming to us, we'd be turning information to them. It's a natural symbiotic relationship. And even you mentioned DevOps. Now we've joined these two roles, right? The developers and the application operations, right? That's a natural symbiotic relationship. And what I'm saying here is I don't think we're at the, the end of this road. I think we're just on the first leg of the journey. Um, I think maybe Karen said it earlier. Soon, it's going to be all of these roles together uh, uh, that, that's going to be sort of expected. You know, there's, we're raising the level of norm. Everyone has said, you know, there's, a, there's an expected level. Well, we're going to expect nearly all of our people who are technical hands-on uh, to have an understanding of all of these silos with a, specializ uh, a specialization in, in one of them, I, I truly believe. The end of the road is going to be just like what we all are, right? Not one of us, uh, uh, Karen it, you know, has said it many times, she's a data person, you know, Edward has said he's a, a security architect. No one is only in one silo. Everyone, every one of you has a server, does storage, you know, works in a NAS, has some cloud experience, has some security experience. Everyone is, has dusted a little bit of experience across all the silos. And, and, and I think eventually we're going to see uh, all of these come to a point where, where we're going to have everyone at the same table to have these discussions when we roll out new services, new applications, new designs. We are coming to the top of our time, and I wanted to have a chance for Alex to jump in here to discuss a little bit, um, kind of his perspective, seeing it from the side of the of the vendor at Efficient IP. Alex, what what do you see as being the drivers behind NetSecOps, and and what do you see the industry doing with it? Uh, just to, before answering your your question, I, I'm old enough in this industry to have work on the mainframe, where all people were working together. I guess we are building too many new things that we have to learn. And, and, and anytime we, every time we add a new thing, we are splitting teams like the cloud, uh, Kubernetes or whatever. Uh, each time is the same scenario. So it's, it's funny to have this uh, discussion uh, all over every five or 10 years. Uh, what, we, what we do see um, uh, is, is that effectively, it's, it's not very easy to work together between, um, like you said, Tom, uh, the objectives of, the, of those two teams are mainly different. Um, we do see enterprises trying to mix the, these teams from at least the budget and the management. And, and they are trying to solve it through tooling, which is probably not the good way. Yes. As we mentioned in the last discussion on uh, improving DNS security, everyone wants to solve the problem with a tool. Nobody wants to be introspective yeah. and realize that the problem could be with you. Yes, and in in this case, I guess it's not uh, it's not a tooling issue, and and whenever it's a tooling issue, there are plenty of tools that may help people to work together for sure. And 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 the the only thing we we work on at uh, at Efficient IP is the this that what what we call the DDI or the IPAM is this global repository for IP information, but that's not that's not the solution. That's part of it, probably. I really what? feel for managers in this, um, you know, it's starting with uh, Net DevOps and now NetSecOps or whatever, but I've been, I've consulted for organizations where for the most part, the network team and the security teams don't even get along. And, uh, you know, they often have different goals. The, you know, the manager for the network team, they're ultimately responsible for uh, network uptime and, and uh, you know, user access to the data that could be um, uh, exfiltrated. Secure SecOps and the manager of those teams, their main job is to keep CIOs and CISOs and CEOs out of the news. And, you know, they're there with their set of tools to be able to shut things down as soon as they see something. Those are, those are kind of uh, at opposite ends of uh, requirements in some ways. And I think perhaps joining these teams is a way to get people working to be better uh, together and, and avoid some of those, uh, some of that infighting in the teams who don't get along. And I just don't know how managers are going to manage that. I feel, I feel for those people that have uh, different um, metrics that they, they need to uh, lead towards. I agree. 
All right, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this discussion here because we are at the top of the hour. But as you can tell, there's a lot of opinion in this particular area, whether it's a, you know, a silo or an overlay or the fact that managers need to work harder to integrate their teams together. Um, I will say that there has been a lot of research done on this topic and uh, efficient IP uh, has contributed to some of that research and you may see a little bit of it coming out pretty soon. Um, stay tuned and we will uh, make sure to, to link you to the, the proper location for that. Um, but I want to say a special thank you to each of our delegates for joining us. Um, this has been a great discussion. Uh, this is one of the things that I love about Field Day is that when you get this many great minds in the room, you have a lot of, uh, of great discussion back and forth. And you don't always have to agree with each other, but you do end up being a little bit smarter at the end of it. And I also want to say a special thank you to Efficient IP and for Alex for joining us uh, to give your perspective on things. Um, I know that um, sometimes you look at it and go, well, you you work for a company that does this for a living. Yes, but it doesn't mean that his opinion isn't you know important or valid. It's just very different from the way that we see things. And the fact that he says that he's agreed with everything we have to say so far means we're all on the right track. It's just a matter of taking these ideas behind using tools, using infrastructure, and using people to better secure DNS so that we don't have to constantly dissect it over and over again to find out where the problems are and where all of the issues are coming up in order to fix it. And of course, if you want to hear more great discussions like this through not only our roundtables, but through our on-premise IT roundtable podcast, head over to gestaltit.com. Uh, we publish one of those usually every other week. Um, and then we always have great videos on these topics at techfieldday.com.